In the crucible of World War II, few machines embodied the spirit of Allied armor like the Sherman tank, as it was the tank that truly gave American armored units their punch in the war. The five GIs that manned each of these steel monsters hoped that their Sherman would live up to its Civil War namesake, carving a decisive path through hostile territory and leaving behind a defeated enemy in its wake. But beyond its iconic silhouette lies a world of hardship and danger. Join us as we venture into the heart of battle to uncover the truth, just how challenging was life inside a Sherman tank. The Sherman was born not long before America entered the war. Conceived as a weapon to aid infantry in tight spots, its purpose was clear, to roll in and blast away machine gun nests, enemy troops, and other soft targets with relentless force. But on the battlefields of Europe, the Sherman was forced to take on a much deadlier job, shooting it out, point blank, with enemy tanks. Handpicked by none other than General George S. Patton Jr., the Sherman tank was hailed for its speed, agility, and ease of transport. It became the workhorse of Allied armored forces, a testament to American ingenuity and innovation on the battlefield. However, the compromises required to achieve these qualities came with sacrifices that crews desired in their tanks. The Sherman's speed and fuel efficiency were attained at the expense of a larger gun and thicker armor compared to many German counterparts. Thus, while the Sherman proved effective in supporting friendly infantry and decimating enemy targets, it remained susceptible to assaults from enemy armor. Initially, the Sherman held a clear advantage over the lighter German tanks, effortlessly outmatching them on the battlefield. However, as the enemy adapted and began deploying heavier tanks to counter the threat, it began to suffer in combat. The vulnerabilities of the tank became glaringly evident in the intense battles that unfolded east of Normandy, where close-quarter combat became the norm. In such confined spaces, the agility of the M4 was less effective, while its weaker armor made it susceptible to the devastating impact of German 75 and 88 mm rounds. The war in Europe, therefore, proved to be a harrowing ordeal for the tank crews, who tirelessly fought their way eastward from Normandy. Trapped in cramped quarters, they found themselves locked in desperate struggles, maneuvering for crucial shots on the flanks and rears of German tanks. In a desperate bid for survival, they resorted to scavenging items from the battlefield to reinforce their own armor all while facing relentless enemy fire. Within the confines of the Sherman turret, a tightly packed trio comprised of the gunner, loader, and commander diligently operated together to ensure the seamless functioning of the tank. However, this collaboration was far from easy in the claustrophobic and confined space they inhabited. The inside of the tank was not only cramped, but it was also hard to breathe, and it was smelly and hot. Moreover, the constant threat of enemy gunfire encircling the tank left little margin for error, making it exceedingly perilous for anyone inside. With its lighter armor, the tank provided only 5 centimeters of steel protection for its occupants, against armor-piercing rounds. Even if the shells missed the crew, there was a constant risk of the ammunition inside igniting. Such an event could lead to the tank imploding, resulting in a catastrophic fate for the soldiers inside. The commander occupied the rear right side of the turret, positioned directly behind the gunner. From this vantage point, he took the orders from the platoon leader or company commander and directed his tank to carry out assigned missions. Equipped with a radio located in the turret's bustle, 
The commander communicated with other tanks in the unit. To do this, he could stand on his seat with his head and shoulders out of the tank and direct the crew over the intercom. In early Shermans, when the hatches were closed and the tank was buttoned up, the commander's visibility was limited to a rotating cupola periscope. However, in later versions of the Sherman, an all-around vision cupola was introduced, providing much better view around the tank. The commander's position was considered the most perilous on the tank, frequently needing to expose himself with his head outside the tank while the rest of the crew remained buttoned up, the commander became a prime target for enemy fire. The gunner typically held the next senior position in the tank hierarchy. Positioned directly in front of the commander, he used the commander's hatch to get in and out. With his own set of turret controls, the gunner had exclusive control over the elevation of the main gun. One might assume the gunner enjoys the best view out of the tank. However, in older models, their visibility was often severely limited. Nevertheless, compared to its contemporaries, the Sherman offered relatively better visibility. The gunner's ability to acquire targets depended on the commander positioning the tank near the target, with the gunner then requiring 5 to 6 seconds to lock onto the target. The loader station was situated on the left side of the gun, directly opposite the gunner. Unlike other tanks of the time, the loader enjoyed enough space to maneuver and even had a fold-up seat for added comfort. Additionally, a fully rotating periscope mounted on the roof above provided the loader with enhanced visibility. In early Shermans, the loader had 12 ready rounds stored around the base of the turret basket, with an additional 8 in a ready rack at his feet. Unfortunately, this setup proved to be a significant vulnerability, as any penetration to the turret or hull that struck these exposed rounds could trigger a chain reaction. This would ignite the propellant in all the ready rounds, resulting in the destruction of the tank and often causing casualties among the crew. This issue was promptly addressed, leading to the removal of the 12 exposed rounds. They were replaced with an armored, 4-round ready rack, and improved models utilized an 8-round ready rack. Additionally, armor was added to both the inside and outside of the sponson and ammo boxes, before eventually phasing them out entirely in favor of wet ammo installations in later improved hulls. Early into later production, 75mm armed Shermans lacked a loader's hatch. This meant that in emergencies, such as if the tank was burning or the loader was wounded and the interior filled with smoke, the loader had to navigate around the main gun to exit through the commander's hatch. This task would be particularly challenging under such dire circumstances. The driver and co-driver occupied separate positions from the turret crew, situated in the forward part of the hull. On early models, they could only access the turret by aligning the holes in the turret basket with the driver's compartment, allowing them to climb into the turret. In early tanks, the hatches for drivers and co-drivers were oval-shaped and small, requiring personnel to twist sideways to pass through them. Initially, the driver's hatch featured a rotating periscope and a direct viewport with an armored cover. However, these viewports were quickly removed from production due to concerns that bullet splash could penetrate them even when closed, posing a significant ballistic weak spot in the armor. Driving the tank was a crucial task, and effective coordination between the driver and the commander was essential for smooth operation. The driver's position was relatively spacious and comfortable compared to other positions in the tank. He had a clear view forward thanks to a fixed periscope and a rotating one integrated into the driver's hatch. Additionally, the seat could be adjusted upwards, allowing the driver to operate the tank with his head sticking out from the hatch. Tank crews often gathered various items to carry on their tanks, with logs being a common choice. 
These logs serve multiple purposes, including providing additional standoff armor against anti-tank fire and aiding in freeing the tank from deep mud when it became stuck. The tanks also had a small hatch for escape, seemingly too small for anyone to fit through. Yet, many soldiers found that with quick decision-making and coordinated efforts, they could use this hatch to escape in case of fire or heavy gunfire. During prolonged drives or battles lasting hours, the conditions inside the tank became nearly intolerable. During intense battles, the tank crew's view of the terrain was limited to a letterbox-sized slit looking straight ahead. They had restricted visibility and minimal space, making it challenging to spot the enemy. The irony of serving in a tank was stark, isolated from the war raging outside, confined within an armored vehicle. Yet, when the tank was hit, there was only a small hatchway standing between the crew and potential incineration. Somewhat like living inside a bomb, a reality especially true for the Sherman. Considerable attention has been drawn to the Sherman's tendency to catch fire when hit, often leading to jokes about it being like a Ronson lighter. However, it's important to note that nearly all tanks of that era were prone to catching fire if their armor was penetrated, as the ammunition was stored dry. It wasn't until the late stages of the war, with the introduction of wet stowage ammunition lockers, that the risk of fire from penetration was significantly reduced. It's also important to note that the Sherman boasted the highest crew survivability rate among tanks extensively used in the war. On average, statistically, one crewman died for every Sherman knocked out. While not ideal, this statistic challenges the perception of the Sherman as a catastrophic flaming coffin, highlighting its survivability compared to common belief. After the loader was provided with his own hatch and the commander's hatch was enlarged, the survivability of the crew undoubtedly increased. With these improvements, all three turret crew members could bail out simultaneously without having to wait in line enhancing their chances of escaping from the tank in case of emergency. In nearly every instance where a Sherman was deemed a combat loss, it was recovered, repaired, and reinstated into battle. This was largely due to the Western Allies' continuous offensive operations and their tendency to retain control of the ground following engagements, where a Sherman was disabled. Tankers encountered dangers that regular infantry did not, but on the whole, being a tanker offered a more comfortable, secure, and less perilous existence compared to being a foot soldier. In most cases, the crews loved their Sherman tank. During several interviews with American tank crewmen from World War II, a prevailing sentiment emerged. Many of them held a deep affection for the Sherman tank. Their admiration for the Sherman stemmed from its ability to shield them from the hazards that frequently claimed the lives of infantrymen surrounding their tank. Despite its flaws, the M4 Sherman proved its worth by emerging victorious in numerous battles where previous tanks would have faltered. Even when facing formidable German Panzer tanks, the Sherman's numerical superiority, mechanical reliability, and unmatched logistical support enabled it to endure and keep fighting. Undoubtedly, the Sherman became a revolutionary tank that provided crucial support to the Allied forces throughout World War II. Its legacy extended beyond the war, with upgraded versions remaining in service during subsequent conflicts, such as the Korean War and the 1965 Indo-Pak War. This enduring presence solidified the Sherman's reputation as one of the most versatile tanks of its era, 